Why are there so many differences between the King James Bible and other modern translations? And given that there are so many differences, can we really trust our English translations of the Bible? That's what we'll look at today. Welcome back to this series on uh, Trust the Bible. Well, so far we have been looking at how we have gone from the autographs, the original writings of Scripture, uh, all the way down to uh, through different steps, through manuscripts, and then critical texts, uh, and then eventually to our ears as we read and study the Bible. And so I'm going to focus on moving from critical texts to the translations that we have today. Uh, first, let's look at uh, this image of Moses. This is done by Michelangelo uh, centuries ago, obviously. And uh, Moses looks uh, a bit odd. Moses has two horns sticking out of his head. And, and you may wonder, why does Moses have horns? Uh, typically, we see cartoons of the devil with, with two horns sticking out of his head. So why would Moses have that? Well, it's based on a verse, Exodus 34, 30. I'm going to read it in the NIV version. It says, When Aaron and all the Israelites saw Moses, his face was radiant, and they were afraid to come near him. That word radiant uh, can, or has been translated different ways. Uh, I believe radiant is a proper translation. It, it means that Moses' face was shining uh, as he came down from the mountain. The King James also uses a word to indicate that. It, it says his face shoneth. Uh, so it uses an older English, but the idea is the same, that, that Moses' face is shining. But in the Latin Vulgate translation that Jerome did all the way back in the early 400s AD, he chose a Latin word that means horns. And so for centuries in medieval art, you'll see Moses portrayed uh, this way. Now, all of this is to say that when we talk about the Bible being the inspired Word of God, we are talking about the original writings of Scripture, the original writings in Greek and Hebrew that we've looked at uh, the past number of videos. It does not mean that every translation of the Bible is perfect and, and completely without error. And this is just a good example, almost a humorous example. It doesn't change any Christian uh, doctrine or theology or anything like that, but it shows that um, translation work can be difficult and, and some uh, mistakes can be made. However, where we're going to end up is that I believe, especially uh, translations we have in English, the major translations are very accurate and help us, the reader, get a very good sense of what the original Greek and Hebrew texts were saying. So let's talk first about the King James Version, uh, done in 1611. Uh, there are many Christians who believe that the King James Version is the only Bible you should ever use, almost as if it is inspired uh, to the extent that the original Greek and Hebrew texts uh, were, and there are many differences between the King James and modern translations. But let me begin to address some of the things you need to know about the King James. First, it was not the first English translation. Some people will argue, well, we have to use the King James because it's the oldest and modern translations have changed things in the Bible. Well, actually, uh, the first complete English Bible was the Coverdale Bible, sometimes called the Great Bible. It was authorized by the Church of England in 1539, so uh, some people will refer to the authorized version, meaning the King James, and that simply means that the, the head of the Church of England, the king, authorized it to be used in the Church of England. But prior to that, the Coverdale Bible was used, and uh, this was a translation that was done in part by Tyndale, the parts he did not translate were done by Coverdale uh, himself. Uh, much of it was translated from the Latin text of the Bible, and so it is, in a sense, a translation of a translation. Um, but it is the first complete Bible that came out in English. Uh, it affects our language today, even in churches. Probably the best example is the Lord's Prayer. And when we say the Lord's Prayer, the most common way that we recite it is we say, Forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. Well, if you read the King James Version, it says, Forgive us our debts uh, as we forgive our debtors. 
So where does the word trespasses come from? It's not in any other modern English translation. It comes from the Coverdale or Great Bible. Um, It worked its way from there into the Book of Common Prayer used by the Church of England. And it was not updated when the King James translation came up. So that's where we get that word from. It's from the Great Bible. The next major English translation is known as the Geneva Bible. It's called the Geneva Bible because a group of English scholars left England where they did not have religious freedom, uh, where they they had to follow the guidelines of the Church of England, and they went to Geneva where other Protestants were uh, in Europe, and they worked on a new translation of the Bible there. And this is the first complete Bible that's going to be a translation from the Greek and Hebrew texts into English. This was used even long after the King James Bible came out. Uh, The pilgrims coming on the Mayflower, they came carrying a Geneva Bible, even though the King James Version had already um, been published. Uh, Also, John Bunyan, who wrote Pilgrim's Progress, one of my favorite books, uh, he quotes from the Bible over and over again in that book, one of the greatest books uh, in English. He he writes that uh, beginning in the 1660s, more than 50 years after the King James Bible came out, and he is quoting from the Geneva Bible. And the reason he did that is because many Baptists and other denominations um, did not like the King James Bible. They, they thought it was the new translation that had made changes, and uh, they were um, wanting to stick with a Bible that wasn't authorized by the Church of England. In fact, it was illegal to be a Baptist at the time that John Bunyan was um, using the Geneva Bible. So the King James represented the, the Bible of the Church of England that was persecuting Baptists and other Christian groups. Uh, next, I, I want to talk about where the text from the King James version of the Bible comes from. Some people think that it was, it's the only translation based on a single Greek and Hebrew manuscript. Uh, That's not actually the case. It is based on a critical text, just like modern English translations. That critical text uh, was put together by Erasmus in 1522, who was a Catholic theologian. He was a great scholar of his day. He did a very good work of producing the best critical text he could at the time. However, it was based on only eight manuscripts uh, of Greek and Hebrew uh, that are relatively late. Now, there are some arguments that those manuscripts are very good manuscripts, but the manuscripts that modern translations, like the NIV, are based on, they're based on critical texts that use over 5,700 Greek Uh, and Hebrew manuscripts. Um, So the work was completed carefully uh, by the greatest scholars of the time, meaning the King James Version. When the King James was done in 1611, the greatest scholars of English and Greek and Hebrew made the best translation possible from Erasmus's critical text. It is beautiful English, especially for the time it, it was a masterpiece. They very carefully had checks and balances and reviewed their work and made sure that it was accurate. Um, And the King James Version, I believe, represents a a great translation of the Bible. There are many verses that uh, I prefer the King James to other translations, and uh, I think that it is a great translation to use. Uh, One of the problems, I think, with the King James, or what can come up, is just understandability. Can I understand this older English if I'm not used to it. If not, I would recommend modern translations. If you love that older English, if you grew up reading the King James Bible, it is a very accurate translation and and I wouldn't discourage someone from using it. Now some of what you'll see on social media though will, will say that you only need to use the King James. And the kind of argument you'll see is represented by this post we're looking at here. It, it shows a list of verses, and on the left column you see the King James, and it says, yes, yes, yes. So Matthew 17, 21, yes. All the other versions, NIV, NASV, and so forth, say removed. And so that is meant to grab your attention to say, wait a minute, why would Matthew 17, 21 not be in these other translations of the Bible. And the idea is that these other translations, the modern translations, are trying to change the Bible, take verses out of the Bible, and therefore uh, you should stay away from those translations if you want the Word of God the way it originally was written. There's a problem with that, though. 
First, let, let's look at one of these verses as an example. Matthew 17, 21 uh, says, How be it this kind goeth not out, but by prayer and fasting. Uh, that's Matthew 17, 21 in the King James Version. Now, what does it say in the NIV? Well, nothing. It's not in the NIV. Um, and that's, that's the point of the post. However, you can look at Mark 9, verse 29 in the NIV, and you'll find a very similar verse. This kind only comes out by prayer. And the point is that the translators of the NIV are not trying to remove this verse from the Bible. They are trying to show that they believe that in the original manuscripts, uh, in the older manuscripts that get a more accurate picture of the autographs, this verse was not in Matthew's original writing. In other words, the King James Version is actually adding this verse in Matthew 17, 21, um, not on, on purpose, not because of any kind of theological motivation, but just because they're working from a text uh, that was later, that there were not as many copies of, that was not as accurate of a critical text as the vast number of manuscripts uh, that point to an earlier, more accurate text that the NIV and other translations are using. The NIV has the same teaching, they just have it in Mark because it was originally in Mark's Gospel. Somewhere along the line, a copyist may have added the same phrase to a place in Matthew because they knew it was in Mark and they, they wanted to get the whole verse there together in Matthew. But uh, as you go through any of these verses, you can look and find that there's no theological agenda here. There's rather an attempt at, at a greater level of accuracy in some of these translations. You're going to come out with the same theology. This isn't going to affect any significant doctrine in Christian teaching. Um, it, it's just a question of trying to get an even higher degree of precision of what the original Greek and Hebrew texts would have had. So here's the point. We talked in an earlier video about the telephone game. Uh, is it the case that Bible translators took manuscripts they translated it into Latin. I mentioned the Latin Vulgate. And then the King James translated the Latin Vulgate into English. And then a modern translation like the NIV took the King James and made changes and updated the language. And the Bible is just steadily changing. No, that's not the case. And so this picture here is not the story of how we get modern translations of the Bible. Instead, it's like this. Um, the modern versions of the Bible take critical texts which have a larger number of manuscripts. They're able to get a very accurate picture of what would have been in the original biblical writings, more accurate now than ever before. And uh, each translation, whether it be the NIV or the ESV or any of the major modern translations, they're individually going back to the, the critical text and making a translation into English. They are teams that work on these. They, have different editing processes. They work very carefully to make sure that the English translation they're giving you, while not perfect, and sometimes it's not clear if a word should be translated one way or the other, or the, the Greek might allow for different types of translations and English has to make a decision. So sometimes if you want to really understand a verse in the original, you might want to compare a couple translations. But on the whole, our English translations are very accurate representations to help us as English speakers understand what the meaning is in the original texts of the Bible. And it's really an amazing story of how we came from these ancient texts, ancient manuscripts, uh, to English translations, to being able to put all those English, English translations together in one small uh, book that we can hold in our hand, um, and can very affordably buy a copy and have and read and understand God's Word. It, it is an amazing story, and, and I hope this encourages you to trust the Bible.